Hello, humans. Welcome back to the study of the Bible in chronological order. Today, we are going to be studying Genesis chapter 35, verses 1 to 27. So, back in Genesis chapter 34, Jacob failed to lead as a father after his daughter Dinah got raped. Consequently, Jacob's sons decided to take matters into their own hands, and they killed Hamor's entire tribe, and then they looted the city. Now, as a result, Jacob feared that the other inhabitants of the land, they would join forces to kill him and his tribe. However, in chapter 35, verse 1, God the Father does not fail to lead, and he instructs Jacob to return to Bethel, to dwell there, and to make an altar there to him who appeared to Jacob 20 years ago after he fled from his brother Esau. Now, if you remember, back in chapter 28, verse 15, the Lord said to Jacob, Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Okay, but what was this land? Bethel, the location where the Lord revealed himself to Jacob in the vision of the stairway to heaven. So, in chapter 35, verses 2 to 3, encouraged and emboldened by his encounter with the Lord, Jacob commands his tribe to get rid of the foreign gods among them, to purify themselves, to change their garments, and then uh, after doing so, then they would all travel to Bethel in order to make an altar to his God who has been with him through everything and never left him. And surprisingly, in verse 4, everyone falls into line and acts in faithful obedience to Jacob's command once again. And so it is written in verse 4. So they gave to Jacob all the foreign gods which they had and the rings which were in their ears, and Jacob hid them under the oak which was near Shechem. Now this oak, which was uh, near Shechem, this oak tree is likely the same oak of Moreh, which, which is mentioned in Genesis chapter 12, verse 6. When Abram traveled to the site of Shechem, where the Lord appeared to Abram and promised him that the land would belong to his descendants. And then Abram built a, an altar there to the Lord. But why did Jacob's entire tribe have to be told to get rid of the foreign gods among them? Well, I mean, evidently the foreign gods that Rachel stole from Laban back in chapter 31, verse 19, they were still with her. But also it is likely that some of the foreign gods came from the plunder that they took after killing Hamor's tribe and looting that entire city, which we saw in chapter 34. But Jacob commanded his tribe to get rid of those idols. Now the burial of these idols at Shechem it may be symbolically significant, implying that the wicked actions of Simeon and Levi reflect the influence of polytheism. In fact, later on in our chronological journey, we will see in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 20 to 22, this is what Paul says. The things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to become sharers in demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? We are not stronger than he, are we? Therefore, Jacob was preparing his family to properly worship the Lord for when they arrive in Bethel. So back in chapter 34, verse 30, Jacob worried that all the other inhabitants of the land, they would all unite together to kill him and his entire tribe. However, chapter 35, verse 5, it states that God had placed a great terror upon all the surrounding cities so that they did not pursue Jacob's tribe as they traveled through. So, in verses 6 to 7, Jacob and his tribe arrive in Luz which will later become known as Bethel. And then Jacob builds an altar there, calling the place El Bethel, 
and that means God of Bethel, or or because Bethel means the house of God, it means uh, the God of the house of God. But back in chapter twenty-eight, verse eighteen, Jacob had only constructed a pillar to God, but now he constructs an altar to God, revealing a personal relationship with the Lord and acknowledging how God has been faithful to him. So, chapter thirty-five, verse eight. Um, the narration seems to abruptly be interrupted here, and it says, Now, Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died, and she was buried below Bethel under the oak. It was named Alon Bakuth, which means oak of weeping. But, but why is the death of Rebekah's nurse mentioned, yet the death of Rebekah is never mentioned? Well, why was there never any weeping for Rebekah mentioned? And why was Rebekah's nurse with Jacob anyway? Well, if you remember, back in chapter 24, verse 59, Rebekah's nurse is briefly mentioned yet without name. <clears throat> she was without name there. But here, a name of the nurse has been given. It's Deborah. Now, it's possible that her presence with Jacob suggests that she had been sent to him by Rebekah in fulfillment of Rebekah's promise to Jacob in chapter 27, verse 45, when she said to him, I will send and get you from there. Nevertheless, scripture is silent on the matter, and so all guesses are mere conjecture. However, one thing seems to be certain. The narration regarding Deborah's burial, it's not an abrupt interruption of, of the storyline here. Rather, it is a continuation of the previous narration, and it showcases a stark contrast to the burial of the false gods, right? So, no tears were shed while burying the false gods under the oak, uh, to be rid of those false gods, it is a good riddance. Goodbye. However, there was weeping involved in Deborah's death when she was buried at the oak. And so there's, it's just a stark contrast there. Verses 9 to 10, it is written that God blessed Jacob. Now, this not only confirms the blessing he received from the Lord in his wrestling match in chapter 32, verse 29, but more importantly, it places Jacob on a par now with Abraham and Isaac, uh, of whom similar affirmations were also made. Now, not only did God bless Jacob, but he also reminded him his name was no longer Jacob, but Israel. So not only did God bring Israel back to the place where he first encountered the Lord, which was back in chapter 28, but God made it known that the God of Bethel is the same God who gave Israel his new identity in chapter 32, after wrestling with Jacob and, and dislocating the socket of his thigh. Therefore, the Lord who revealed himself at the top of the stairway to heaven is the same Lord who wrestled with Jacob and gave him his new name, his new identity of Israel. But chapter 35, verse 11, God gives Israel a new name by which he can call the Lord, El Shaddai, which means God Almighty or God Most Powerful. And this is this is also how God revealed himself to Abraham back in chapter 17. And it's also how Isaac referred to God in chapter 28 when he blessed Jacob. And continuing in uh, chapter 35, verses 11 through 12, God Almighty says to Israel, Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall come from you, and kings shall come forth from you. The land which I give to Abraham and Isaac, I will give to you, and I will give the land to your descendants after you. 
So when God said, be fruitful and multiply, <laughs> it was the same command that God gave to Adam and Eve in chapter 1, verse 28, and to Noah and his sons after the flood in, in chapter 9, verse 1. But it was also the blessing that Isaac spoke to Jacob right before he fled from his brother Esau in chapter 28. And when God said that nations and kings would come from him, that was the same promise that God gave to Abraham back in chapter 17. Therefore, God declares that Israel is indeed the one who will continue what God started through Abraham. So, uh, chapter 35, verses 13 to 16. After God finished speaking, Israel set up a pillar, he anointed it with oil, and then the entire tribe of Israel continued on their journey toward Ephrath. Uh, however, on the way, Rachel began to give birth, but she had great difficulty and she suffered severely through her labor. And then in verse 17, a midwife said to Rachel, do not fear, for now you have another son. Why did she say that? Well, in fact, the birth of this son was exactly what Rachel had desired. Back in chapter 30, verses 23 to 24, after giving birth to Joseph, believing that God had taken away her reproach, she named her son Joseph, saying, May the Lord give me another son, because the meaning of Joseph is, may he add, which implied that her prayer was for God to give her yet another son. Therefore, this new son was the answer to Rachel's prayer. However, in verse 18 here, it says that Rachel's soul departed from her body while giving birth. Now, the Hebrew word translated here as soul, it is the same word that had been used in chapter 2, verse 7, when God gave Adam the breath of life and he became a living being. So living being is the same as soul, which is the Hebrew word nephesh, which means soul, self, life, the inner being of a person, mind, living being, creature, desire, emotion, passion, activity uh, of the mind, will, character that which breathes, that which possesses the breath. So, this is the same word that had been used in chapter 1 of Genesis, which describes all the sea, land, and air animals that possess breath. This is the breath of life. Thus, Rachel breathed her last breath, and her body died while giving birth to this new son. However, in her last moments, she named her son Ben Odni, which means son of my sorrow. But Israel quickly changed the name of his son and called him Benjamin, which means Benjamin, or, or that means son of the right hand. And this indicates a place of honor and status. In fact, Jewish commentators note that this name indicates that Benjamin was Israel's favorite son and that this is consistent with the favoritism shown to both of Rachel's sons. And later on in our chronological journey, we will actually see that in a different time period, Psalm 110, it will show a similar meaning for this idiom. Therefore, Israel refused to allow Benjamin to be blamed for the death of Rachel and to have that horrible character trait follow him his entire life. Instead, Israel celebrated the fact that even through death, another life came into existence. But, but, but was Benjamin to blame for Rachel's death? No. Now, in fact, in chapter 30, verse 1, it says, that when Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, she became jealous of her sister, and she said to Jacob, Give me children, or else I die. And then in chapter 31, verse 32, after Rachel stole Laban's gods, 
Jacob had said to Laban, he said, the one with whom you find your gods shall not live. Well, consequently, Rachel's death was ironic because she did not die because she had no children. Rather, she died while giving birth to a child. Further, Rachel's death seems to be a fulfillment of Jacob's curse because Rachel had been guilty of stealing Laban's gods and they were in her possession at the time of Jacob's curse being pronounced. Therefore, chapter 35, verse 19, it says, Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is, Bethlehem. So, so, Luz later becomes known as Bethel. That's what verse 6 told us. And now here in verse 19, it tells us that Ephrath will later be become known as Bethlehem. Now, because these minor and seemingly insignificant details will become important later on, we must notate them now so that we will be able to remember them later on when these details arise again. So chapter 35, verse 20, Jacob set up a pillar over Rachel's grave. And then verse 21, it says, they all continued on their journey until Israel stopped and he pitched his tent beyond Migdal Eder, which means tower of the flock. And this indicates that it, it was a shepherd's watchtower near Ephrath or, or Bethlehem. And then chapter 35, verse 22 it seems to once again abruptly interrupt the narration story here. And it states, It came about while Israel was dwelling in that land that Reuben went and lay with Bilchah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard of it. Okay, but why so abrupt on this story? What? Why had evil infiltrated at this time? Why Reuben? Why Bilchah? Well, Dinah had recently been raped. Israel heard about that, yet he failed to take action about it. And so Israel's sons bypassed the authority of their father and they took matters into their own hands, killing all of the males of Chomorah's tribe and looting the city. Further, Rachel had just died and, and they were all traveling without knowing what to expect. Therefore, it is reasonable to believe that everyone who had been, uh, you know, they'd been overwhelmed by emotions and most likely they were filled with anxiety, stress. But the fact that Reuben had sexual relations with his father's concubine, it showcases his lack of respect for his father. Now, possession of the concubines that belonged to the head of the tribe was presumably a sign of leadership in the tribe. Typically, when the father died, the care and ownership of the concubines as part of his property passed on to the next head of the tribe. But to seize ownership of the concubines prior to the father's death would be understood as an act of, of subversion and disrespect, comparable to seizing land or herds. But it would not be unusual if succession to uh, tribe leadership were contested. In this context, Reuben's offense against his father circumvented proper succession procedures, and it implies that his father was powerless. Now, regardless of motive here, this act, it was not as abrupt as it may seem while reading the text. Rather, no, this had been building up like a volcano ready to erupt ever since Israel failed to lead as a father when Dinah got raped in the chapter prior. Reuben was the firstborn, and Bilchah had been Rachel's maid. So therefore, it is likely that because Rachel was no longer around to watch over Bilchah and, and to keep her held accountable, Bilchah seized the opportunity here to to pursue either pleasure or purpose uh, for herself. But, but why Reuben? Now, I believe it is reasonable to assume that because he was the firstborn, 
this was in some way an act of rebellion against Israel on Reuben's part uh, and a prideful expression of his own authority as the rightful heir and future leader of the tribe. And because Reuben was the oldest son, well, he would have been the one closest in age to Bilha. Now, we cannot know for certain, but Bilha could have chosen to have sexual relations with Reuben because she knew that he was the firstborn. So consequently, it's possible Bilha had hopes of becoming like the main woman, the wife of the new future tribe. However, it's also possible that there existed no ulterior motives other than just primal pursuit of pleasure at the expense of purpose and that they had both been merely led by lust. However, this was, it was not only a great sin against Israel, it was also a great sin against two of Reuben's brothers because Bilha was the mother of Reuben's brothers, Dan and Naphtali. But chapter 35, verse 22, it states that Israel heard about this great sin and yet scripture does not state that Israel did anything about it. And so Israel not only failed to take action against the great sin against Dinah being raped, but now he fails to take action against this great sin of Reuben having sexual intercourse with Bilhah. And because this great sin, it involves multiple people, verses 23 to 26 here, it explains once again the relation between all of the children in Israel's tribe here. But due to the birth of Benjamin, this list is now updated and it's now complete. So in order, uh, we have from Leah, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. And then we have from Bilcha, who was Rachel's maid, Dan, and Naphtali. Um, and then we have from Zilpah, who was Leah's maid, Gad and Asher. And then once again, we have from Leah, Issachar and Zebulun. And then of course, we have from Rachel, Joseph, and now Benjamin. So in conclusion to this, this new drama here, chapter 35, verse 27, it says, Jacob came to his father, Isaac, at Memre uh, of Kiriath Arba, that is, Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac sojourned. So again, the minor details that seem insignificant, they should be noted. Memre was a site near Hebron, where Abraham had settled. We see this in chapter 13, 14, and 18. And it's also where Isaac also later lived. The land of Kiriath Arba will later be known as Hebron. And so this, this one chapter, chapter 35, it identifies three locations while clarifying their updated and current names which indicates the time period it was written. So the author wrote at a later time and then explained what happened in the past. Therefore, God brought Israel to Hebron, which connected him with Abraham and Isaac. And it's highlighting the fact that through Israel, the continuance of God's ultimate plan will be fulfilled. However, a minor detail in verse 27 here, it also reveals yet something strange here. It, it's another omittance of Rebekah. An examination of scripture reveals that Rebekah was omitted in chapter 30, and that was 14 years after Jacob had fled from his brother Esau. And then she was omitted in chapter 31, verse 18. That was 20 years after Jacob fled from Esau. Moreover, here in chapter 35, verse 8, Scripture mentions the death of Rebekah's nurse, Deborah, uh, and the weeping that happened due to her death. But there's no mention of ma made of Rebekah's death or any weeping that happened due to her death. 
And finally, at verse 27 here, it only mentions Israel's father, Isaac, but the mother, Rebekah, she is omitted. And because Rebekah was omitted from all accounts, I think it is reasonable to believe that not only had Rebekah probably died long ago, but Scripture, for some reason, does not seem to honor her. But, but what reason would that be for, for not honoring her? Well, I don't know. The, the last bit of information that we knew about Rebekah is that she favored Jacob over Esau, and, and she convinced Jacob to deceive his father, her husband, Isaac, in order to steal the blessing that rightfully belonged to her firstborn, Esau. So consequently, Rebekah might have been omitted because she was not honored. However, Scripture is silent on this matter, and so that thought must remain as mere conjecture. But again, it's good to think about these things. In summary, the sons of Israel disrespected and dishonored their earthly father, but Israel desired to revere and honor his father in heaven. And despite this dysfunction within Israel's family, God still chose the Israelites to be his chosen people by which he will accomplish his ultimate plan for his creation. This chapter highlights how life here on this earth can seem to be falling apart while all the divine pieces in the spiritual realm are falling into place. Even though everything seemed to be going wrong, God was causing all things to work together for good to those who love him, for those who are called according to his purpose just as Paul will later say in Romans 8, 28. So, a couple questions to consider here. So, in Genesis chapter 35, verse 2, Israel commanded his family to get rid of their idols. Unless we also get rid of the idols in our lives, they can divert our focus and ruin our relationship with the Lord. Now, sadly, Many people proclaim belief in God while at the same time showcasing loyalty to idols. Many people acknowledge God without living rightly for God. Is that you? I pray not. Do you claim God while living a life of idolatry? Listen, an idol is anything that replaces the one true God in priority and in position uh, idolatry extends beyond the worship of, of statues, uh, images, idols, these false gods. Our modern idols, they are many, they are varied. And even for those who do not physically bow before a statue, idolatry is a matter of the heart. Pride, self-centeredness, greed, gluttony, a love for possessions, ultimately rebellion against God in any act of unfaithfulness. So are you placing anything or anyone above God in priority and or position? Money, pornography, drugs, alcohol, a sports team, sports player, a singer, musician, a band, a social media platform, who or what is receiving your devotion at the time when you should be devoted to the Lord and his word? Are you merely acknowledging God, but not living for God according to his word in alignment with his will? In verse 10, God reminded Israel of his new identity. He is someone who will not let go of the Lord until he is blessed. He is someone who holds on to the Lord while the Lord showcases his power on Israel's behalf. Now, although everything seemed to be falling apart, God reminds Israel that with the Lord, 
everything will fall into place. This was a reminder that Israel needed to keep his eyes on the Lord and obey his commands, despite what things might look like in the flesh while in this physical world. Many people wrongly believe that Christianity should enable a life free from problems while only being blessed. As a negative consequence to this wrong belief, many people become disillusioned and they abandon the, the way and they walk away from the Lord, disheartened, disappointed, disillusioned. Instead, we need to learn from Israel. We need to become determined not to let go of the Lord until we receive the Lord's blessing. However, we typically do not ever receive the Lord's blessing until we endure the storms of life and we prevail in holding on to the Lord. Problems and difficulties in this life here on this earth, they are inevitable. They are unavoidable. Therefore, we might as well view them as opportunities for growth. After all, how can we prevail unless we have a problem to prevail over? If God says he is El Shaddai, God Almighty, and that nothing is too difficult for him, just as he told Abraham in chapter 18, do you believe him or not? Who's your daddy? Is he a good father or not? Until next time.